Are we good to go? Okay, good morning. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Thank you for your patience. And welcome to the Fall Quarter Diversity Series keynote presentation. Um, I'd like to start by asking folks to turn off their cell phones if you have them. So I'll do that together. <laughs> Thanks a lot. My name is Paul Gallegos, and Teresa Liba and I will be your hosts today. This year, the Diversity Series turns to the arts to explore issues of identity, representation, and social justice. And we're very fortunate to open the series with the 2007 Amherst College Copeland Fellow, poet Suher Hamad. Before we invite Suher to the stage, I want to make a few acknowledgments and announcements. Um, talked about cell phones. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge that it's Halloween and we've got the spirits in the house. Can we get a view of those on camera? Okay. One of the object objectives of the series is to provide these special presentations focused on diversity and equity to complement the work of the college's academic programs. And I want to acknowledge the 12 academic programs that are participating today and this evening. And they include practice and community, cornerstone seminar, children in education, fashioning the body, me and my shadow, language, literature, and the schools, made for contemplation, World, world Literature, Middle East as Case Study, City Life, <laughs> Music and Culture, Heroes of the Heart, and one additional program situated outside of Olympia. Part of the power of the diversity series is that each autumn we introduce the Olympia campus students to our Tacoma program. The students in Tacoma will be participating today through video teleconferencing. Uh, this is made possible through the wonderful efforts of Dave Crampton, Raul Berman, and the Media Services team. I want to thank them very much. Let's all give them a round of applause. <laughs> this year, Dave has put together a series of video vignettes to introduce us to the Tacoma faculty. Let's take a look. My name is Bracey Dangerfield, and I'm a visiting professor here at the Tacoma campus. I have a background in physiology and also in chemistry, and my role here is to improve the scientific literacy of students in the Tacoma campus. I really see my role here as helping them to dissolve those boundaries and becoming comfortable with the use of science and the understanding of science that's required and is so prevalent within our contemporary environment. I see the Tacoma experience as a whole as one which removes barriers and helps students to bridge the gap between their experiences that they've had uh, in the past before they come here. And some have had very challenging experiences, but the Tacoma campus really allows them to not only develop intellectually and emotionally, but it's really a spiritual experience, I believe, for them. It's a way of allowing them to become whole people, and scientific literacy is very much a part of being able to do that. We try to not only give them intellectual understanding through uh, using the concepts of science, but also add some hands-on experience in the lab so that uh, they are able to more fully appreciate the role of science in their everyday life. 
Uh, my name is Peter Bacho, and I've been teaching at the TESC Tacoma program since 2005. My focus is on writing, uh, helping students improve their writing skills. In this quarter, I'm team teaching with Arlen Spites on a class uh, focused on web design. My name is Arlen Spites. I teach in the Tacoma campus program. The focus of the course from my end is uh, developing the ability of the students to communicate in a new medium. The web has become ubiquitous as a medium of communication. Uh, the ability to, uh, to produce work for the web removes a barrier. It, it enhances uh, a student's attractiveness, I think, to, to uh, potential employers or to graduate schools, etc. The, the situation here is a bit unique because I'm, I'm working with Dr. Bacho to uh, enhance the course. It, uh, the students get to write about what they do after the class time is over. And the, it seems that that has, uh, that's, that's very beneficial to the, to the process of learning it. Immediately after the class on Thursday, we hold a writing session uh, on Friday. Uh, and um, students work in small groups. The small group process works very, very well. Because of this uh, writing that goes on after the class, they usually come back with a, a very good grasp of it and we're able to work from that base. You usually make better progress uh, than I, I've seen happen in other circumstances. I'm Barbara Laners and I'm a visitor, have been for the last five, almost six years and I teach primarily issues dealing with history, law and public policy. And I'm Paul McCrary, uh, this is my second year here at Evergreen Tacoma campus and I teach mathematics, uh, social justice, and science. We're teaching history by the numbers. And this is a new concept, a new way to teach history. We don't teach the great man and great woman theory. What we're looking at in guns, germs, and steel is uh, another way of looking at why historical phenomena occurs. And it may be problematic for some students, but with others, they they like it because you're not focusing on a date and this great man. My view is that if students are actively engaged in seeking information and seeking understandings and seeking solutions to problems together, then they're learning. The emphasis is on investigation and having a dialogue. If the students are articulating their ideas, even while their ideas are forming, then they'll be learning and often learning about learning and that's a very powerful education setting. Hi, my name is Tyrus Smith. My background's in environmental science and policy. And I'm Sharon Katz and my background is in psychology. We're teaching the research design class this fall quarter and the focus of this class is to get students engaged with scholarly, peer-reviewed literature on the subjects in their area of interest. And the way we're doing this is by hands-on groups. We're researching issues of social justice and um, other issues that impact the students in their family and community and school. We're doing an in vivo research study where we're actually studying the class, um, answering some research questions that the students generated, and, um, and they're going to have a research proposal at the end that is in an area that will impact some area of their lives. And more than this, they'll be addressing also some ethical dilemmas that are present in research and getting some rich discussions about not only the, the knowledge gained from research, but the implications and some of the uh, disparities that might be arise in terms of power relationships in the pursuit of knowledge. We are learning how to critically evaluate research articles so that uh, the students will be good consumers of research and good consumers of um, advertising on the media, good consumers of medical information that they're receiving. And more importantly, more informed, more knowledgeable, and more skilled citizens and professionals in the community. Hi, my name is Gilda Shepard, and I'm a sociologist and media studies and cultural studies professor here at Tacoma Program. Um, my name is uh, Ming Xiao Li, and uh, also being called Zhang Er. I'm a new faculty on Tacoma campus. Uh, right now, I'm teaching biology, occasionally Asian studies and uh, Chinese poetry. Dr. Shepard and I is teach, co teaching a class called Self Poetry Through Skin. And this class really is an integration of science, particularly biology, and sociology, where 
Dr. Lee talks about the biological influence and makeup of skin. I talk about its environmental and sociological and cultural implications. We started the biology part from the evolution series and uh, we examine how that um, old series been uh, evolved, actually been uh, supplemented by recent new findings in genetic studies. And talking from there, we examine the construct of race as well as the misconcept of race in terms of their biology background. So Students would write a paper, each student would write a paper, but also they create a kind of art installation that is a synthesis of their paper that talks about, that gives a self-portrait of themselves through the landscape of skin. And that's the world-class faculty on the Tacoma campus of the Evergreen State College. Hello, RT. My, hey, Paul. How are you? Wonderful. It's nice to have you joining us today. Thank you so very much for extending the invitation to us. Hello, Therese. How are you? It's good to see all of you in Olympia. We here in Tacoma have been focusing on the theme, removing barriers, bridging the gaps. We recognize the needs in our communities, the disparities, the social and health injustices that exist. And we are preparing our students to cure those ills. We have a wonderful student body. Our average age is 37. Though we range, we're diverse in terms of our ages, our ethnicities, our religious backgrounds or non-religious backgrounds, and our genders. So this is a wonderful, welcoming place to be on the Tacoma campus. And as you saw, our faculty is world class. Many of them, <laughs> are double degrees. MD, PhD, JD, LLM, all of that, and all of them have the doctorates. Everybody's well prepared and committed to making a change in our world. This is revolutionary work that we do here in Tacoma. In addressing diverse needs, we also have sign language interpreters. Today, they are Dora Jones and Angie Parsons. Thank you, Dr. Young. It's now my pleasure to introduce faculty member Therese Saliba. Good morning, everyone in Olympia. Greetings to our sister campus in Tacoma. Uh, before I had the opportunity, is there some feedback? There's, okay. Oh, it's the screen. Okay. <laughs> before I met Suhair and had a chance to see her perform, her poetry would come to me across the internet like lifelines in times of crisis. In the days following 9-11, during the buildup to the Iraq War, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, her bold words and passionate performance confront the injustices of war, occupation, racism, dispossession, prisons, gender inequality, all while affirming our shared humanity and our ability to survive and resist, to love and create, and to maintain hope through times of struggle. Palestinian spoken word artist Suhair Hamad hails from Brooklyn, New York. 
She was brought to the world's attention through her award-winning performance in Russell Simmons Presents Deaf Poetry Jam on Broadway, then a 51-city tour, and then on HBO. Her first collection of poetry entitled Born Palestinian, Born Black was published when she was just 22 years old. Her recent collection, Zatar Diva, is described by one critic as a blend of lyrical insight and urbane wit. Here's a poetry that urges a wholeness, a crossing of borders, as the personal is woven into the pu public, whereby a prodigal daughter possesses her own knowing voice. So Hare's work has been published in numerous periodicals including Essence, Stress, Hip Hop Magazine, and Middle East Report, and in anthologies such as Shattering the Stereotypes, Muslim Women Speak Out, and 33 Things Every Girl Should Know About Women's History. Suhair has produced plays including Blood Trinity from New York Hip Hop Theater Festival and Reorientalism for the Center for Cultural Exchange. Her poetry has been featured on the BBC World Service and National Public Radio, and she has traveled throughout the world performing, giving workshops at universities, prisons, cultural centers. She comes to, mo to us most recently from Berlin. Please join me in welcoming Suher Hamad. <laughs> Mic check, one, two, one, two, can you hear me? Mic check, one, two. Mike checked my bags at the airport in a random routine check. I understand, Mike, I do. You two were altered that day. And most days, most folks operate on fear, often hate. This is my check, your job. And I am always random, I understand. It was folks who looked smelled, maybe prayed like me. Can you hear me, Mike? Red cheeks with blonde buzz cut, corn flower eyes, and a cross round your neck, Mike, check. Folks who looked like you stank so bad the Indians smelled them before they landed. They murdered one, two, one, two as they prayed, spread smallpox as alms. Mike, check, yes. I packed my own bags. Can you hear me? No, they have not been out of my possession. Thanks, Mike. You have a good day too. One, two, check Mike, check Mike. Ayo, Mike, who's gonna check you? What's up, Evergreen? Let me hear you make some noise this morning. Wake up! It's early. I know it's early, y'all. I know. I actually clapped for myself when you introduced me. I was like, wait, really? Is, are they still asleep? <laughs> um, cameraman, please make sure you get my boots for Tacoma. <laughs> That's right, Tacoma. You're on my mind. This is so exciting. I've never done this monitor thing before. So don't get too close. I, do, I am dehydrated. <laughs> don't get the pores and stuff, but the boots, for sure. <laughs> So I'm just so happy to be here. I'm gonna do a gang of different poems. Is that cool? You, you don't have to clap between each one. You don't have to do nothing. Don't boo. Save those particular opinions for your teachers or your peers. Nah. Um, but you can clap if you want to. You can testify. It's, it's all good. But I, what I wanted to do today was kind of do some older poems and then some newer poems and then have a conversation and see what y'all are up to. Um, so it is Halloween today. I am an Arab. <laughs> That's what it feels like sometimes. Um, this is exotic. Don't want to be your exotic like some delicate, fragile, colorful bird imprisoned, caged in a land far into the stretch of her wings. Don't want to be your exotic. Women everywhere look just like me, some taller, darker, nicer than me, but like me just the same. Women everywhere carry my nose on their faces, my name on their spirits. Don't seduce yourself with my otherness. The beat of my lashes against each other ain't some dark desert beat. It's just a blink. Get over it. <laughs> Don't build around me your fetish, 
Fantasy, your lustful profanity to cage me in. Clip my wings. Don't want to be your exotic. Your loving of my beauty ain't more than funky fornication. Plain pink perversion. In fact, nasty necrophilia. Because my beauty is dead to you. Not your harem girl, geisha doll, banana picker, pom-pom girl, poom poom short, coffee maker, town whore, belly dancer, private dancer, la malenche, venus, hot and tot, laundry girl, video ho, your immaculate vessel, emasculating princess, don't want to be not your erotic, not your exotic. Um, what happened? Oh, you need me to move forward? Y'all can't see me in Tacoma? <laughs> Can you see me? You see me just fine, right? They don't need to be all up in my mouth. <laughs> I have Medicaid dental, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to be all up in there. Um, so uh, I want to do a poem for my dad. This poem is called Daddy's Song. Do you all know um, Sam Cooke? So I actually have, a, I never tell this story about this poem, but I guess I will. When I was on Broadway, uh, I had the amazing experience of never being censored, right? Never, ever, ever, even as a Palestinian. It was like, I mean, my producers really protected me from the letters and the threats against the show because, of being, because I was Palestinian. Um, but there was only one request, which was to make this poem, which is about my father and Sam Cooke, um, to change one of the lines in it so that I wouldn't hurt Spike Lee's feelings because it's about the movie and Malcolm X and Sam Cooke and my father and all these things. And um, so I'll read you the poem and then I'll tell you what Spike Lee said. You always loved classics. Said new music was shit. Just like comedians couldn't make jokes without getting nasty no more, singers couldn't sing. In your day, there was Sinatra, Presley, and you hated him. Wouldn't let us watch his flicks and some cat named Cook. All the time, Sam Cook could sing. Sam Cook sang real songs, simple and good. I was in high school the first time I heard your mixtape of Cook classics, and I fell in love with that voice. Smooth, smooth. And I fell in love with the daddy. I thought all this time talking about some Sinatra, Presley-like guy, not this sweet, sweet music. I was in college when we rented Malcolm's Life on video, and maybe the best thing Spike Lee ever did was play that song, your song, as Malcolm, I mean Denzel, was getting ready to die. You cried in your easy boy, reclining your head to better listen. That was you, daddy born by a river in a little tent. And I swear you've been running ever since. That's my song too, Daddy. And one day, I'm gonna sing it for you in a poem. So um, then Spike Lee came to see the show the next day. His manager called me when I met him. He said, you might be right. <laughs> But that was before the Levy's film, which I have to say, you know, once he made the Levy's film, that I was in New Orleans when it premiered, and you know, as an artist, the idea of representing and reflecting a city after trauma, there was not one person in New Orleans across racial and class borders that I met who didn't love those films and that project. So I give it up, give it up. Oh, that's great, give it up. This is poem's called Give It Back. So I know we're supposed to be all empathetic, and compassionate. This is part of why we're here, right? Diversity. But sometimes you just have to say what you feel and what you think. And I was having a really hard time. I've been having a really hard time. First, I started having a hard time with Madeleine Albright. This goes back to like Madeleine Albright. And then I have a hard time with Hillary Clinton. And I have a hard time with Condoleezza Rice. And I have a hard time with just people telling me who my, my allies should be and what solidarity is based on things I didn't make up, or things that don't really affect me in my life. So this is a poem for women who are warmongers, and it's asking them to give back their coochies. <laughs> I'm not saying this should be made into a law, 
<laughs> I'm not saying go hunt coochies that are violent. I'm not saying any of that. This is just how I felt. And um, it's called Give It Back. <laughs> Give it back. How did you get it? Give it back. You're not using it right, no right to it. Return it to the earth, the ancestors, the spirits vanishing the physical. Enough. Allowance has been made for women like you, but genocide is unacceptable. You're going to have to give it back. There are plenty of sweet gay boys who could put it to some proper use. <laughs> and some women would appreciate another one just for fun. <laughs> give it up. You saw odd with guns and missiles. Put them down there then and give back what brings life, cherishes life, saves life. Your mama must not have told you it was a gift. Your time is up, home girl. Give it here. Yes, you are sorry. No, you can't have it back later. There are serious consequences, remember? Now get out my face with your war horn, and don't you come calling when those bombs and those guns are aimed at you. Ooh, wow. um, that poem is in a new book by Eve Ensler, which I think is called like Prayers and Chants Songs. And so it was an evening of women written work that was anti-violence work. And I think out of like 50 performers, everyone did this like sweet sisterhood kind of thing. And then I got up there and did that. <laughs> and it worked for me because it's really what I felt. But I don't know if it worked for everyone there that night. <laughs> I mean, my thing is, I can't take what is not, you know, what I can't take, so why are you scared? <laughs> the givers. Okay, so this is like, you know, to balance that out. <laughs> this is a poem about um, the trees in Palestine, the first time I went to Palestine. I'm from Brooklyn. By the way, I do not know how um, the hand signers in Tacoma are going to translate the Brooklyn that's coming out of me. So let me know how you all do that, because I would love to learn some of those signs for flyness. <laughs> um, so the first time I went to Palestine, I was like, what, where are the trees? The trees are this different color, I don't know, like, first of all, I really, I know this is gonna sound like a sob song, but I grew up in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, where truly the only trees were in the cemetery up the block from me, like, it's not a joke. Um, and so I had this idea of what nature looked like only from television and the Brady Bunch, which I guess wasn't really nature. <laughs> but it was, I had no idea. And so the first, actually my first trip in America outside of Brooklyn was to this part of the world, to Whidbey Island. And I was kind of like overwhelmed by nature and every, the green, all kinds of green that was out here. And then when I got to Palestine, I'd never seen this particular type of beauty. So this poem is for the trees. It's called The Givers. This is modest beauty, a lowered gaze, muted color, a flutter, shadows, a murmur. I'm looking for history in neon light, billboards splayed on chests, but this is quiet beauty, and I need to sit still, concentrate to hear the blood below my feet, the spirits within me, on me. Under every stone, a myth. Behind every branch, a prophecy. Trees, trees here bear fruit, as sisters bear life, as duty and beauty both. Trees here stand, roots apart, branches on trunks, neck turned to God and say, girl, where you been? What you bring? Drink some tea. We got stories to tell you. Um, thank you. Thanks for clapping. I appreciate it. Um, where is some of my best friends? So this poem is called Some of My Best Friends, and it's really specifically to um, like angels in my life who have guided me through, again, what people think uh, my solidarity is supposed to look like and who my friends are supposed to be. And so it's, it's a play on this idea like, oh, some of my best friends are black. No, some of my best friends are differently abled. I have a queer uncle. Um, so then I'd be like, some of my best friends are Jews. And people are like. <laughs> Actually, my Jewish friends, we use them. Um, my friend uh, says that she's our mule. 
And because when, when she goes into Israel, she doesn't get checked, her bags don't get checked. So that's how we like get vitamins and clothing for the kids that we work with in the refugee camp. So every time, she goes like so many times a year, they just think she's being like a really good Jewish American girl and like going back to her homeland. And what she's doing actually is taking stuff in for us and getting it into Ramallah without any problems. So this is for her, who shall rename, remain anonymous to y'all because we have to keep doing it. <laughs> Some of my best friends, below their crisp skin, but above the pulse, they bear the numbers, inked onto their ancestors who chant in their blood, never, again, never. They own their own names. They bring rugula into my home and share stories of kids pulling hats in search of horns. We cry and laugh in the same breath. We look for each other in crowds of flags, loud speakers who silence us. Our solidarity angers others who would always rather war. When we do, we argue with each other the way we do within ourselves, fiercely, and with the security of knowing love is larger than our details. These are my people, and we are chosen. Family eating darkness, hiccuping light, little by little by light, by little, by light, together. Thank you. Okay. How y'all feeling? Feeling good? Are there, are y'all, so I heard all the programs that are here today. And thank you, oh, I was so nervous that I was gonna be reading to a gang of people in costumes. <laughs> Halloween in general freaks me out. Because I always feel like they're going to hunt witches again. <laughs> and on any given day, I'm a witch. <laughs> so I always feel like Halloween is like the one day where people get to be free, right? And I feel like we should be free all the time. So, um, and we all wear masks all the time in all these different ways. So I always had this feeling of like Halloween being the sanctioned time where you could be a freak or you could like show all the different parts of you. And I'm for Halloween all year round. How about that? <laughs> what do you think? Are you going to get dressed later? <laughs> what are you going to be? Something, drag. Something in drag? It's all drag, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to wear heels? Are you going to shave your legs? <laughs> <laughs> are you going to, okay, are you up for waxing your legs? I don't know. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> It'll last longer. It'll be smoother and you'll have less chance of ingrowns. No? <laughs> Anyone else gonna, what are y'all? Anyone else gonna be something for Halloween that's, if, what you gonna be? What, wait, what? You're gonna actually put something else on? <laughs> are you Humpty Dumpty? No, I'm Tweedledum. <laughs> Tacoma, I thought she was Humpty Dumpty, but she's Tweedledum. <laughs> You're hilarious. You're cracking yourself up. It's awesome. <laughs> I, I love it. I just want people to look at me. That's all. No, well, you look really cute. I saw you when I walked in. And these are your friends that you're embarrassing? Yeah. Don't be embarrassed. What do you have in your hand? A skateboard. So his drag is skateboarding. Anyone else? Anyone going to be like a house elf or a Harry Potter character? Oh, you're too highbrow. Wait. Does someone say they're going to be a Harry Potter character in the back? No. The Hang in Their Kitten. But who? The Hang in Their Kitten. The Hang in Their Kitten. I have a Hang in Their Kitten. <laughs> I feel like that every day. Oh my God. That's crazy. But mine is Lord Help Me Hang in There. That's my kitten. Oh wow. I, that's really funny. The Hang in Their Do you guys know the Hang in Their Kitten? Do you ever feel that way? I was going to read this other poem. Let me see. Where is it? Where's the prayer band? Hmm. Okay, wait. I have all my papers in disarray. Okay, so maybe what I'll do is while I'm looking for those, I'll read a, uh, a poem about where I'm from in New York. Yes, that's weird. I don't know where that poem went. Um, so this poem is called Brooklyn. And I got to read it at the reopening of the Brooklyn Museum, which was like the museum. It's a huge, amazing art museum. And it's across the street from 
uh, the, where I went to high school. And if you could believe it, the, they had closed down the front of the museum for two years while they were renovating it, and they had this big gala. And I was the only person of color invited to read. It was in Brooklyn. And I just got up there, I was like, uh, where's Brooklyn? <laughs> And but I, so I read this poem there. I wrote it for the I wrote it for myself because it was like, how do you write about Brooklyn when Jay Z and Biggie have done it so much better and <laughs> all over the world? So you do, I think m maybe more than other places. Although you got to rep for where you're from, wherever it is. Um, Brooklyn has uh, a posture, and so I just wanted to write a, a real love letter to where I come from. Sometimes we pose you loud like a cheap trophy posturing, look at me, from the planet of illest MCs and brickish cheese. Sometimes, quietly. We know the streets is watching and our actions recorded. We seek with you from those who patrol our thought and study our style. We leave you in order to see your beauty from a distance. Back home in instance, we drop baggage and settle into ourselves. Your children travel far. And wherever we are, we hear BK represent always the loud assist. We say, if you make it here, you got nothing to fear. True, every hood fashion fly shit, but they come to your streets to make it legit. You got as many stories as streets as each of us shaped by your concrete and green. You became the safe Jerusalem for us not chosen, yet did not shelter Yusuf Hawkins running from hate. If we tell the truth, here, we got nothing to fear. You molded heroes and sent them out on record tours. Brooklyn, I could write you forever, on every corner, on the backs of handball players, with the exhaust of your buildings for your exhausted masses. I could write you forever on the absences and abundances of the childhoods you gifted us. Listen to how you gallop from my mouth. Make folks smile just to hear me talk, because they trace my cadence back to you. We always return, and like love and heartbreak are two sides, one coin. You are your daughter's currency in foreign cities. We always come home, and you always make room, like expandable apartments filled with immigrants and their labors. You always make room for our sins and our saviors. You always make room for prodigal daughters who sometimes talk out loud to ourselves just to hear your stories come out our mouths. Thank you. Here it is. Okay. So I want to read um, a poem for New Orleans. How many of y'all have been to New Orleans? Anyone? Some, a few. Have many of you, have you been there um, after uh, Hurricane Katrina? It's different. New Orleans will never be the same. Um, so I think one of the things when we talk about diversity in, uh, in our bodies is that people tell you if you're an artist, you should only really be writing about certain things or that success comes from the academy or success comes from a commercial kind of crossover. I don't know what that really means, crossover. But that, it, it, that success means all these different things, right? And that artists um, have a responsibility to their craft first and foremost and that any artist who engages in the world around her is somehow undermined as, as a craftsperson, as a, someone who studies her craft and her art, because she can speak to the realities in front of her. So when I went to New Orleans, um, right after Katrina, I heard this conversation on the radio and on television about the word refugees. And I was really able to like sit back um, in my home for a week before I headed out and listen to the conversation that was going back and forth, particularly with African Americans from New Orleans and the media about who had the right to call who a refugee and what a refugee actually was. Um, and then I got down, so then of course what I decided to do, my troublemaking ass, was I had a fundraiser <laughs> called Refugees for Refugees. And I was like, if you don't consider yourself a refugee, you ain't gotta take this $10. But we raised about $13,000 cash from $20 and $15 at the door. Not one big check. Not one person who had even $100 to give. That was from $15 and $20 at the door. And then we had about 10 containers 
of boots and clothes and medicine that all went down there before us. And we got to Jackson, we got to Jackson, Mississippi, served for about three or four days doing like volunteer work. This goes back to the sense of like what an artist's responsibility was. When I got down, I decided to go to New Orleans because the reports that were coming back from the shelters were that 80 percent of the people coming in were illiterate. 80 percent of the Lower Ninth Ward was functionally illiterate. What that means is they can fill out a, a bill for a phone. They could actually enroll their children into a school, but could they write a letter to the principal of the school? So when I went down there, that's, I actually went down there to fill out paperwork for folks. And um, I had this conversation in the shelters about the word refugees. And people didn't really care at the point where they'd been in the shelter for four weeks. But I told people like three things, which was, I'm from Brooklyn, which is the ghetto pass. Not all parts of Brooklyn, you just kind of have to feel it. But that helped a lot, just walking up in there and be like, I'm from Brooklyn, I came down to help. Then I told him I was a Palestinian, um, and if you leave, you might never let me back up in here. And they heard that too. And the third thing I said was that I was a poet, and that's all that mattered to people. Because at that point, people had been giving interviews and filling out forms for the Red Cross, an organization I would never give my money to, by the way, um, for weeks. And they had nothing else to say. But when you told them that you were a poet, suddenly they remembered something. They had a different experience of the same thing that they told over and over. And they had hope somewhere in their cultural retention. They had hope that if they talked to a poet about what they were feeling, people hundreds and thousands of miles away would hear their stories somehow, knowing that we could never fully represent another being, but sharing a moment in a trauma and in a crisis. They believed in that because I was a poet. And so that only a poet could have done that. Only an artist could have gotten that information. And so this idea of what an artist is supposed to do or where your allegiances are supposed to lie has to be worried and it has to be questioned. This is in America on refuge and language. I do not wish to place words in living mouths or bury the dead dishonorably. I am not deaf to cries escaping shelters that citizens are not refugees. Refugees are not Americans. I will not use language one way or another to accommodate my comfort. All I know is this. No peoples ever choose to claim status of dispossessed. No peoples want pity above compassion. No enslaved peoples ever called themselves slaves. What do we pledge allegiance to? A government that leaves its old to die of thirst surrounded by water is a foreign government. People who are streaming illiterate into paperwork have long ago been abandoned. I think of coded language and all that words carry on their backs. I think of how it is always the poor who are tagged and boxed with labels not of their own choosing. I think of my grandparents and how some called them refugees, others called them non-existent. They called themselves landless, which means homeless. Before the hurricane, no tents were prepared for the fleeing because Americans do not live in tents. Tents are for Haiti, for Rwanda, for Bosnia. Refugees are the rest of the world, those left to defend their human decency against conditions the rich keep their animals from, those who have too many children, those who always have open hands and empty bellies, those whose numbers are massive, those who seek refuge from nature's currents and man's resources, those who are forgotten in the mean times, those who remember. Ahmed from Guinea makes my falafel sandwich and says, so this is your country? Yes, Amadou. This my country and these my people evacuated as if criminal, shot by soldiers, rescued by neighbors, adamant they belong. The rest of the world can now see what I have seen. Do not look away. The rest of the world lives here too in America. Thank you. So, so I hope you guys get to New Orleans. I hope you go. It's, it's worth being there. It's worth, uh, it's one of the most beautiful, amazing places I'd ever been. It was definitely the most special place, city I'd been in America. It was the first time in my life in America no one asked me where I was from. 
I, I mean, I can't tell you what it feels like if you've never had that experience of a daily questioning of where you're from. Um, I can't even explain what it feels like to go home one day, you know, after walking the streets all day and not have to have dealt with that. It was, it was a trip. Um, okay, so now I'm going to read some new work, which I'm really excited about. Um, I don't know, y'all could get excited about it, hopefully. <laughs> So about a year and a half ago, I decided that um, I was no longer interested in translating what was in my mind onto the page, which is really the way we learn to write. It's really the way we learn to speak, right? Like we learn to speak by you know, having all these different conversations in our mind and then figuring out what is the like, appropriate or correct way of saying something and then saying it to get our points across. So then I just decided actually what would happen if I just started writing what was in my mind? And what was in my mind was a very Spanish-inflected English, was the history of hip-hop culture, was Arabic in a way that I was using in my dreams and in the way I felt, but not out loud. I don't know how to uh, read or write Arabic, but it was such a part of my upbringing. And then I realized that like, my language was breaking. Um, and everything around me felt to be breaking. I would pick up the newspaper and not believe what I read. Uh, I would have a phone conversation with a friend and, re and figure out that like the majority of conversations in America right now are being monitored. It's not a personal attack against you. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's just the way we operate now as a country. So there are all these things about intimacy and language and the way we represent ourselves that were breaking for me. Um, so, I, so I've been writing these poems and each poem is actually called Break. This is the other thing, right? It's everything is everything. And then the poems are called Break and then they have a, a second title or another idea that go with it. And um, I think this first one that I read does not actually have Arabic in it. So it won't be, I won't have to translate any of it for you. This is Break Clustered. All holy history banned. Unwritten books predicted the past. Projected future, but my head unwraps around what appears limitless man's creative violence. Whose son will it be? Which male child will perish a new day? We, we, oh, our boys' death galvanize. Our boys' deaths galvanize. Bitches get beat daily. We mourn women complicated. We cherish corpses, profits made, profits ignored. Worn tooth enamel salted lemon childhoods. All colors run, none of us solid. Don't look for shadow behind me. I carry it within. I live cycles of light and darkness. Rhythm is half silence. I see now, I never was one and not the other. Sickness, health, tender violence. I think now I never was pure. Before form, I was storm. Blind, ignorant, still am. Humanity contracted itself. Blind, malignant, I never was pure. Girl spoiled before ripened. Language can't math me. I experience exponentially. Everything is everything. One woman loses 15, maybe 20 members of her family. One woman loses six. One woman loses her head. One woman searches rubble. One woman feeds on trash. One woman shoots her face. One woman shoots her husband. One woman straps herself. One woman gives birth to a baby. One woman gives birth to borders. One woman lo no longer believes love will find her. One woman never did. Where do refugee hearts go? Broken, dissed, placed where they're not from, don't want to be missed, faced with absence. We mourn each one, or we mean nothing at all. My spine cups. Ugh. My spine curves spiral, precipice running to and running from human beings. Cluster bombs left behind, de facto landmines, a smoldering grief. Harvest contaminated tobacco, harvest bombs, harvest baby teeth, harvest palms, smoke, harvest witness, smoke, salvation, smoke, resolutions, smoke, redemption, smoke, breathe. Do not fear what has blown up, if you must fear the unexploded. So you guys, um, so now I've been using lots of Arabic words. Does anyone in here speak Arabic? Raise your hands. The CIA is looking for recruits. Raise your hands. <laughs> Let them know where you are. Actually, I was watching. They already know. They already know. That's true. Because I was watching uh, Arabic satellite at my parents' house during Ramadan, 
And I, I'm not kidding. Like the way they have, I don't know, Summer's Eve commercials during um, soap operas. <laughs> they had like recruitment for FBI and CIA, but it, was, it wasn't on the regular television. It was only on satellite. I was like, this is hilarious. And it's during Ramadan. So it's like people are already hungry and dizzy and weak and hated and oppressed, don't know what to do. They're like, I'm going to get me a job. God is good. It was so funny. <laughs> these two I wrote, these are two small break poems. I wrote them uh, this spring. I spent three months in Palestine for the first time in my life. I do have um, an American citizenship, but it was through the kindness of an anonymous Jew who signed for me and sponsored me that I was allowed into the country. So you have to know that. And I normally would say an Israeli, but she actually has dual citizenship. And I would also say Zionist, but she doesn't consider herself a Zionist. The only thing that mattered to the authorities that took her social security number, her national ID, was that she recognized herself as Jewish. And then I have never met this woman. And she let me in. This is called Break Sister. Zay in Arabic means light. Habibi means beloved. Wa means and. It's also half of wawa, which is a boo-boo. <laughs> Bas means stop or enough or still, any of those. Break sister. Ramallah is closed. Zaya heart shuddered, wa fortified. Bas inside, awaiting, a held breath. Gaza is on fire, Zaya heart feeding on itself, so hungry, mistaking flame for warmth. Cities where women die like this, Habibi, where cities where women live. This is Break Nahr al Barad. Nahr al Barad um, was a refugee camp in Lebanon, which you probably, if you were tuned into international news earlier this year, burned to the ground. And um, Nahr al Barad means the cool river. Ana means myself or I. Oh, yes, that's right, girl, Ana. So the whole idea is this when I, when I read these poems to, in America, I tell people, like, you might not get 20% of the language here. Well, welcome to my parents' life in America, which is all about reaching for the nuances and subtleties of the English language. And so if you get uncomfortable, you get scared, just sit back and actually feel like you're part of the majority for once. It's not a scary thing sometimes to not know. Because really, you don't know. <laughs> Even when it's in English. <laughs> or especially then. Break Nahr al barad Cool river burning. Anna threading wounded knee. Salt water breaking. A planet is my body. A higher glyph. Habibi's sphinx lips on Nile back, shabab drum face, jaded stone, eyes domed were hooded, Hathor moon bloodletting, refugees rewind exile. <clears throat> Poem is my body, my language, my country, wabas, and a closed to tourism, and a closed to journalists, wabas, and a closed to translation. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'm going to do um, one more poem, which will be a break poem, and then there's Q&A. But here, this is how I feel about Q&A. The way I feel about Q&A is if you really don't have a question, but you want to make a comment, just say that. Don't put it into a question form. Because I get confused. And I think you really want to answer, but you don't. And actually, I'm much more interested in what you have to say. And so do that. Like, you don't have to get up and ask a question, because I sure don't know. I can tell you right now, I don't know the answer. But I would really love to know like, what you guys are doing, what you guys are thinking about, how you feel about the concept of diversity in an institution, what you feel about this institution. Um, I myself have not graduated college, although I'm a Copeland Fellow at Amherst this year. So when y'all were reading, when they were reading all those letters behind, <laughs> Do like PhD, MD, L, L. I was like, what the? So when they, when I accepted, <laughs> when I accepted the fellowship, they, they, they wrote me and were like, what letters go behind your name? <laughs> Could have been very embarrassing. Um, so then I wrote back to here, Hamad B C, which stands for Born Connoisseur. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, but now I teach, I, you know, I teach at universities and I teach at prisons and it's, you'd be surprised how much they have in common, actually, <laughs> when it comes to um, the need to fit in, right? The need to be in a box. Evergreen is a really special place. I mean, you guys know that. That's part of the reason why you're here. If you're here for other reasons, you will soon find out it's a special place. There aren't many places in the world that fashion students and human beings that go all the way around the world to stand witness. And for that, you should protect yourselves and you protect this institution and each other in a way that I cannot say about any other place. And my reading at Tacoma a few years ago was one of the most amazing and special readings I've ever had in my life. And that what they gave me back, I've taken with me all over the world. So also know that you do have another campus. You have like another set of peers who've had really different experiences and have so much to add to your life and you have the opportunity um, to learn it. So that's my pitch, basically, for Evergreen, and it's from my heart. I wasn't really expecting to do that. Because usually I'm like, school sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm messing up on these break poems because I actually don't, I've never read them out loud. And some of the words are really hard, actually. They look really fun on the paper when I put them together, but um, they're like, it's a little difficult to go through them. But I'm going to go through this a little bit, give you some of the Arabic that's in here. Um, you remember what wa means? Yes, and half a boo-boo. <laughs> and uh, amar means the moon, right? Nar is fire. Let's see. Zaytun. Do you guys know Zaytun? Very good. That's right. Like 50, at least 50% of Spanish is Arabic. The Moors, yo. 800 years in Europe. There's never been a clash of civilizations. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, oh, yes. And then there's some stuff that, you know, Sawah is a traveler, Ahwa is coffee. Um, and this is the thing, when I read this poem to a friend of mine who speaks Arabic, he was worried, or all of these poems, he was worried about, you know, the audiences or the readers understanding and listening to them. And one of the poems is called Break of Dawn. So I asked him, what do you think Break of Dawn means? And he was like, oh, the sunrise. So actually, he didn't get that Break of Dawn is a really specific hip-hop terminology, and it carries with it so many different things. When you say Break of Dawn to someone, it means we're going to be out all night. We're going to party. We're going to do all this stuff. We're going to see the sunrise. It's different than saying we're going to be hanging out this evening. <laughs> so it goes back to like what we think we understand, right? Because he read, he read Break of Dawn. He's like, I, I got this. I have access to this language. And it's really, we have to always worry it. We always have to ask. And even if you can come in the front way, sometimes it's mu much more fun to come in the back way or the side way and ask, you know, ask the questions of the language. All we have is language. And we see the abuse of it every day on our newspapers and on television and reality shows. This is reality shows, right? You see how people are really living and what we're really aspiring to. So just as um, what we wear is a vibration, our language is a vibration, our hugs are vibrations, the language that we use are pure vibration. That's all they ever come down to at the end of the day. This is break rebirth. <clears throat> Jesus left at 33. Full Saturn revolution returning Messiah. Math a myth. Wa language a lie. Scorpio sun. Wa libra amar. Yo, this beat nod, yo. Nod head right off, blow up spot, will kill crowd, will bomb walls, break dance, will break off, grilled face, iced teeth, break me, sick, ill music, sickle, self, amnesia, and a gathering cells into new, city under construction, Gaza eyes, pitted zaytun, spit meat, tekassam, Brooklyn broken English, what exiled Arabs sampled, I start to blink, and then I think reality paper, my thoughts, the ink, what I'm writing is strapped in between these lines. I'll escape when I outrun time. And a sawah, wa thousand, wa one nights, wa ahwak, morning ahwa, boiling resurrection, no sugar, no touch. Habibi writ his name in water, rhymed 16 bars, was sang mawal, blue, heavy brass hair, wool, anna, wa anna still waiting, missing messiahs, a self missing my, Habibi don't see me. He gave stars of different flames. I left at 33. 
33 shots from twin clocks. Yo, 16 apiece equal 32. That means one of, so one of God's sons was holding 17. 27 hit my Saturn dream. Six went into me. Everybody got to be born sometime. That is Nas. <laughs> My eyes burned phosphorus, darkened angels broke wings, no touch, no touch, so much language clustered, so much damage cluttered, morgue drawers, baby corpses combust when exposed to air. In Gaza, doctors open bombed bodies, find organs on fire. Were these people still alive? The dead, their wounds flame after spirit gone. Fluorescent gardens tended by pyromaniacal men. And a Werde exploded, tears combusting me open, cranial guitar strumming me a psalm. My palms stigmatized, heart white butterflies expand lungs. What bestend a new vision, same old, same sold humanity. Somebody touch me, Jesus. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Suhair, for the inspiration. Um, she, yeah. another round for Suhair. We're going to move into Q&A, and Suhair sort of laid down her um, guidelines for Q&A. So I guess it's sort of comment and question and answer. Um, is there anyone at the Tacoma campus who has a question or comment for Suhair that would like to begin? Why are you going to pick on them? Well, <laughs> we thought we'd give them the first option of getting involved and interacting. Maybe there's no one up at the mic yet. Okay. Um, there are mics right here in the, on both sides where folks can come. Is, is there one on that side? I'm not seeing it. Oh, just on this side of the lecture hall. So for the Olympia group, you can come down to the mic here. And we do have a sister in Tacoma who's ready to ask a question. Could you please introduce yourself and give your question or comment to Suhair? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rosetta Brown, and I'm from Tacoma. Um, so here, thank you very much. I'm also from Brooklyn. I'm from Crown Heights. And I would, <laughs> I would like to say thank you very much. You represent Brooklyn well. I appreciate your straightforwardness, your honesty. And as you said, sometimes you have to tell it like it is, and you have to tell it like you feel. And I really did appreciate that. That really hit home to me, and it, it touched the reality. So I want to say thank you for your words for for the way that they inform, the way that they enlighten, and the way that they educate all that hear it. God bless. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brooklyn. You want to say Brooklyn? Yeah, I just thank you so much. Brooklyn always represents. It's a special place if you guys have not been there. Um, please do. Yusuf Hawkins, who I mentioned in that poem, was a young black teenager who in the, my, my teenage life was the first um, boy that I knew of to have been killed by a, a white mob in a, a, an area of Brooklyn called Bensonhurst. So um, you can look up his story or you can relate it to the thousands of other stories of young men of color who have been um, dragged through the streets of this country. But that's who Yusuf Hawkins in is, and um, I thank you very much for coming out. Great. Do we have a question from Olympia? Somebody want to step up to the mic? Where's your halo? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was raised in South of the Island for about 11 years, and I was just wondering what your inspiration was for your poetry that you brought back, and, and when like, did you go there? Oh, that's, thank you for asking that, because for all of the women writers in the room, I actually applied and got into a writer's residency on Whidbey Island called Hedgebrook, and I really hope that if you're a woman writer, um, it's, it's one of the few places that's only for women in the country, so don't feel bad, guys. <laughs> Don't start being all mad that you can't get up in there. It's like they always get mad and start reverse the whatever. But um, but so that's why I went. And Hedgebrook has about six cottages, and you get your own cottage. And you get to work on whatever you want. You don't have to have been published. I, when I got there, I'd been published, but I'd never been to anything like it before. I got rejected the first time, and they let me back in. But I remember, um, did I even have a C? I don't even think I had CDs back then. Just because I'm always late. I mean, there were CDs, but I'm always late, late to technology. Um, but I bought Eric B. and Rakim with me, 
and some John Coltrane, mm -hmm. and I was in the woods. But I'll tell you what, that first trip, I never went out late at night. I was still really scared. I mean, and they were all like, you come from the jungle. How are you going to be scared? But have you, have you been there? Have you been to that residency before? I, I haven't. I was mostly raised on the, on the south end. Are you a writer? Um, my mom is. Well, you should both look it up, hedgebrook.org. And any, any woman here, please, I, I really highly recommend it. My friends have gone, and they've had amazing experiences. So that's what took me there. And I wrote a play while I was there called Blood Trinity. And I, it allowed me the space to do the, the legal research on the play. Thank you very much. Now put your halo back on, girl. <laughs> Everybody got to see you. And uh, will we turn to Tacoma? We have a question. Actually, I'm not going to throw a question at you because you said that you get easily confused. Well, so do I. I want to tell you how refreshing your poetry is. How uh, it, it's like uh, got the impact of a train wreck but you still got that scream of the butterfly. Word up! Oh. Uh, it's, it's like, I was telling Emperor Basho over here that uh, you change channels just as fast as Dylan does. If you put your, if you put your work to music, you'd be dead dangerous. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. And I'm going to quote you. <laughs> That's the best blurb ever. Maybe uh, Suhair could put that on her next book. Yeah, I'm going to make that into a t-shirt. A train wreck butterfly. <laughs> Love it. All right, back to Olympia. Um, hi, I am a writer and I want to say thank you so much because you're very inspiring. That was beautiful to hear. And, um, my question that I have for you, I'm doing research on um, artistic communities and the identity of an artist and how a community can foster or hinder that. And I just wanted to know, is there a community of which you feel that you're a part that has either helped you or hindered your progress? As a what have you found for yourself? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of looking into various, I'm in the program City Life, and I'm looking at various different cities and seeing what sort of communities they have. I mean, I'm a part of a community here in Olympia, and it has, at times, really inspired me, and other times it's really held me back. Yeah. And it's hard to struggle. You struggle with becoming an artist and feeling okay with saying, I'm an artist, and not I'm something else, or right. having like a real job, you know? Yes. So I, I'm interested in what you have experienced. Well, I appreciate it, and I hope you, find, you, you share your findings with your peers. Mm -hmm. Um, because not all of us have the time to do that research. So that's really awesome that you're doing it. I find that most writers actually start writing because they're so alone mm -hmm. and that they're in their mind all the time. And yeah. you probably feel like I do, that I could be in a room of 4,000 people and still feel alone. Um, and so therefore, what, what community actually means in terms of nurturing your art is a situation or people or art that feeds that solitude and that actually feeds the solitary voice. Mm -hmm. And there are things, you know, that, um, that you can do on your own. And then there are allegiances and kind of, kinds of ties. For instance, you could just like do a writing group for people with cool glasses like you have, <laughs> right? Or be like, yeah, she does have cool glasses. She has a whole look going. It's really <laughs> awesome. Um, so I, I think, the, I, I think, again, it's like questioning what community is automatically, what people tell, where people tell you you're going to fit. I think a downside um, of writing groups and of art groups in general is that our art sometimes becomes incestuous. Forget the actual relationships, which is like <laughs> drama enough. But that you, know, you only kind of begin to reflect each other. And while it's good on part of your journey, it can't be all of your journey. And I have found, because I was published so young, I had a I didn't have a peer group. My peers were still writing. And then, so I was already published by the time they were still publishing in journals and taking classes. So I had mentors much more than I had peers. And I would really, for everybody here, whatever it is that you want to do, like find mentors who challenge you. Because there's nothing that my peers have given me that hasn't been exponentially benefited by having a mentor who, or, and several mentors. I really, really recommend that highly. Because you can always find people who want to hang out with you and who want to do the same work that you do. But finding people who've already gone through it in a different way and who have things to add to your life, is, that's, the, that's the rare treat. And if you can find that, that community will follow. Thank you. Thank you for so your much. question. Yeah. And good luck with your writing. Thanks. <laughs> and back to 
Tacoma. Tacoma? Hello. Hello, Hi. hello. Uh, my name is Cheryl. I just want to say, Sam Cook, you brought tears to my eyes. For real, that's the truth. Anyone who grew up just hearing that music and what you felt, it was so powerful. Um, I represent Tacoma. You see, nobody yells. It's not like Woo Brooklyn. Tacoma! <laughs> I don't know. What do they do? What's okay. your sign? Okay, there they are. There they are. Much love. I. <laughs> okay, they're a little late. They're not like BK. But <laughs> I wish I had brought my daughter. She's six years old, and um, you're powerful, Ma. You're powerful. And I want to know what really brought you and pen and paper together. What some people say it's love, some people say it's hate. That really makes them uh, want to write, want to speak, want to talk to others and, and get a message out there. What, what, what did it for you? What really started it all? If I tell you, will you tell me what did it for you? <laughs> oh, yeah, I will. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, um, I always <laughs> love to read. So for me, it was my parents were really, really strict. I was under lockdown all the time. I, I couldn't do any like after school activities. And then by the time I could, it, the, hot, the block was really just too hot. So I found myself reading against the public school system's better judgment. I mean, I actually had to go find books because our libraries were so badly, I can't even begin to tell you. And I got to like seventh grade and was, um, was basically like reprimanded or cross-examined by my English teacher for having read Shakespeare. He actually like made me say, wow. yeah, he, I had to like defend myself and prove that I, now mind you, reading Shakespeare at 11 or 12 doesn't mean you understand it. <laughs> but um, I was always hungry for, for other people's stories. And I always say that like my favorite writers are readers first. And you see that after all of the kind of style and shine and performance is gone, you can really tell who loves the language and the craft and who cares that they won't be, like I won't be here. And right. maybe your daughter won't ever see me, but I'll have left her some books and I'll have left her some free things on the internet <laughs> um, right. to read. So you can tell me what got you into writing. Oh man. <laughs> Uh, what is it? It's, uh, it's a song I always read to my, excuse me, I always sing to my daughter. Um, uh, it's an old slave song. Sam Cooke did it. Aretha Franklin Reed did it. Can you think of the name? The Hem of His Garment. No, no, what is no. It? Um, uh, summertime. Oh, summertime. Summertime. Yeah. Come on, people. Come mm. on, represent. <laughs> <laughs> Same situation, at home, all alone, latchkey kid, putting on my parents' old albums, oh, wow. Sam Cooke Summertime. So, thank you. Thank you for sharing that so much. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, wow. That was awesome. Do you guys know that song? Yeah. Summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping. Huh? And Time. then what? We should all sing it for her. Come on. Your daddy's rich and your mama's good looking. Come on, come on. Don't you cry. See, you got a serenade, girl. All right. From the president of the school. Our president is doing it so good. There it is. That was awesome. That was awesome. Thanks. We got another question in Olympia. Um, well, I wasn't allowed to take writing classes in college because my parents thought it would corrupt me. And so I was actually in college and I had to show my, um, 
my program, you know, like your class program, every, the beginning of every semester to my parents so they could make sure I wasn't doing any like women's studies classes or like anything that might like keep me from becoming a doctor and a lawyer and marriageable. Um, so I've done everything opposite. But I, I submit, the first thing I ever submitted, uh, first of all, I hate the word submission. The, the poet Reggie Gaines told me this a long time ago. He said, don't submit to your, your work to anyone. Send it in for their consideration. Okay. And just think again about language when we say I'm sending in a submission or calling for submission. Well, who the hell wants to answer that? I want to call, answer a call for submission, but consideration. Um, I sent in work to my college journal. Uh, I was at Hunter College. I did go to school several times trying to get out. Um, and they did reject me the first time, and then it turned out they, were, they all knew each other, so they're all in the same writing classes. <laughs> and so when then my poems got there, they're like, who is this? We don't know this person. I got in on the second try, and then it was, I had a few like teachers who um, would tell me about programs, but girl, I, I had no idea about what was out there. I really just wrote for myself, and then as soon as I was published, I was put into this category as a political poet and a spoken word poet, which meant that like, you know, it, it, sty it stymies you. It means that you can't do anything else or you can't write about other things. And I just always did. So when I, I was writing for a hip hop magazine, I was the first woman column in a hip hop magazine and it was the longest running column in a national music magazine written by a woman. And a hip hop magazine did that, right? Not Rolling Stone, not Spin. It's like really important. I found support within my communities. So I was writing for hip hop magazines and then also sending work into college journals. And I've always maintained that I might not be a star in any of those worlds, but I will have left behind a legacy. And the only thing I can tell you, like I've met so many amazing people, especially through Deaf Poetry Jam, because we just met, you know, people that you would recognize, like walking down the street. And the happiest people have always wanted, have always done what they wanted to do. I can honestly say that. I've met really, really rich people and really powerful people. And some of them have gotten there because they did what they wanted to do, and you feel that difference when you walk in. So what do you want to do? I want to be a children's book author and illustrator. Let's just do it. That's but okay. I wrote, and I don't even know what starts and anything like that. No, it's okay. How, how are your parents saying now? Well, They're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I always like, um, well, no, her question was how do my parents think, what do my parents think of my work right now? <laughs> huh? Now that like you. Now that they didn't kill me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, they're cool. They still wish that I didn't curse. That really embarrasses them when I curse on HBO. But, you know, then I'm like, Daddy, what is a motherfucker? <laughs> what is another word? Um, so they really dislike that. And my mom is always watching my cleavage. Like, actually, your parents never change. I mean, there are things that change, but then there are things that are like, I can't believe you wore that shirt on television. Like, that's the biggest conversation. Um, but what is your name? Anastasia. Anastasia. I think what... Um, I have reconciliation with my family about being a writer and an artist because I always knew that their fear was that I couldn't support myself and that not only their culture but larger American culture especially doesn't respect women artists and that if you do get published and you are on television that you probably slept your way to the top and that's not an Arab mentality that's an American mentality just as much as every, every woman artist I know has gone through it so I never blamed my parents for wanting me to do different I always under I really didn't. I never had that period of rejecting them because I felt like they were doing the best that they could. And so I think there's a way of respecting your community and your culture without killing yourself. There has to be a way, otherwise there's no hope. I mean, you say you believe in hope of progress of communities and, and diversity and like equalization, then you have to have the hope that you can be yourself and they can be themselves and we can learn from each other. So. I wish you all the best with the children's book. Because that's a, you know, it's a little world. Yeah. But you can do it. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Speaking of um, <laughs> children, we have a, a beautiful little ladybug, it looks like, at the Tacoma campus. Oh <laughs> and hey. Hi, my name is Monet, and this is Genesis. She is a ladybug today. Genesis? Um, Say hi. Genesis, Genesis Rain. Yes. Yeah. Um, what I want to do, Ma, is give you props because, you know, if I was little and I came up around women like you, it would have just been an amazing thing. And so it's so beautiful to see you here outspoken and independent and just 
as multi everything that you are. You're a beautiful woman, and I want to give you congrats on that and props on that. And I also want to give you extend your hand, extend my hand to you, and congratulations for bringing in the international concept. Concept because I am I call myself a student of international relations and very interested in international politics and how we as Americans look to other countries and um, and how they look at us. And I think that you just bring this dynamic to it and bring in the whole oh, hip hop flavor. I just think that you're bringing everything together in the mix. Yeah, girl. Excuse my head roll. But it's so, it's so beautiful. I appreciate it. It's so you beautiful. So much. And I just want to say thank you for being a wonderful example of publishing yourself, giving our children and someone to look up to. You're a beautiful woman. I thank appreciate you. you so much. I reflect okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Me blush, right? That's amazing. Okay. I'm so blessed. Um, Hello. Teresa. Hi. How are my you? name's Teresa Wood Santoso, and um, on behalf of my husband, uh, I would like to tell you that not only are you a, I, I'm a little nervous, I, not only are you a role model for women and young women in this country and this audience, but um, as a Muslim from Indonesia, my husband is not very demonstrative, but he saw you on Deaf Comedy Jam and was actually bouncing up and down <laughs> on the sofa. And he said, <laughs> he, he actually said um, he'd, he'd been uh, made quite nervous. Uh, we moved here right after 9-11. We lo both lost our jobs and our homes um, living overseas. And anyway, uh, he came back and, and was, you know, in the midst of the, the culture that it had become here. And um, he said, so our American daughter, do you think could be like her? <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's great. Um, I, just, I wanted to say something. Yeah. I think of your daughter when I'm on Broadway and I'm on television and the way I'm asked to dress and the things I'm asked to talk about and the way I, I'm asked to hold myself. And I battled so much <laughs> um, with, with, the, with the idea of theater and the idea of performance. I battled so much not to be dressed up like a hoe at any given time. And it was horrible. And I always said to them, there's a girl out there whose father is going to be just as strict as mine, whose mother is going to be just as alienated from this culture, and they're going to hear everything I say, but if they see my cleavage or they see my ass, they're going to say, you can't be like her, because that's what happened to me. And it was a struggle, because on one hand, I really, you know, I dress the way I want to dress in my life, and I, you know, I do, I move as I will, and I, am a, I believe in freedom, and then I also believe in, like, representation at a given point. So I just want you to know that I held your daughter in my heart, because I know how hard it is. And I know how, you know how hard it will be. And she has a different reality than the one I grew up with. And I'll pray for her. Yes. I thank you. Thanks. We have a guy at Tacoma. <laughs> yeah. Tacoma. Welcome. Hello. Hello. I'd like to, uh, hi, hi. I like your suggestion to Madeline Albright and Condi very much. <laughs> and I like, I, 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 I like what you said. Um, about writing, uh, how writers uh, be alone in a crowd of 4,000 people, you know, I write. And, uh, you know, the same thing is, is said about uh, uh, drug addicts and drug addiction. And I write stories about uh, heroin addicts. And um, it's not sensationalized, and, uh, and it's not clinical, it's in the language, because I was there. Yes. And uh, is that street language, it's the only poetry that America really got. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, and people don't know, but it is, I mean, and all that stuff swept under the rug. And I guess I got a kind of a selfish question. Uh, what I do, I, I do it good. I write very good stories. Ain't no happy endings, because that, you know, you don't have no happy endings. At the same time, you know, I've been sending this stuff out to a lot of literary journals, and all the stories that are in them are written by MFA graduates mm -hmm. about relationships and stuff that got nothing to do with what I'm talking about, and so I got a lot of rejection letters, just like John Steinbeck did. He got about 836 million of them. And so my selfish question is, 
you know, who, who can I ship this off to? Maybe you want to uh, run it because it's good. Yeah. And people need to know about this because, uh, you know, it, it's all swept under the rug or it's sensationalized or it's clinicized and people don't see people in that milieu as human yeah. beings. But it is America writ small because America is a dope fiend. Mm. Oh, well, I hope that's the title of your book. <laughs> Pardon me? I hope America is a dope fiend is the title of your book. Because I well, would buy that I'm right gonna, there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that under consideration. <laughs> That's good. Um, what is your name? Robert. Robert, thank Robert you so Christmas. much. Thank you so Pardon? much for um, just asking your question and for sharing what you shared. So the first thing I want to do is I want to tell you about several poets who are also writing about this, who are published. Uh, Willie Perdomo. Lamont Steptoe, Piri Thomas, who also has written uh, biographies. So just those three men, I would recommend to you to know that you're not alone and that you have peers and men who are writing about their own everythings. Um, and then the other thing, I mean, I would ask you, are you reading these journals, the journals that you're sending work off to, are they actually things that you enjoy? When you finish reading the journal, do you feel impressed or moved by any of that work? I ain't impressed with none of it. Well, then that's why it's not for you. I Do you found see? that out this Yeah. Summer. So the idea is like to take your work to the people. I mean, the first, place, the first places I really started to steadily perform was in domestic violence shelters and in prisons. And I was doing that way before HBO was interested in me or publishers were interested in me. So I think, again, you have to affirm your work. It's like your child, and you're putting your child these stories that have no happy endings, that are all your truth, and you're sending it to people who are not, who don't write this way, who don't think this way, and who are actually engaged in keeping those stories out. So that, we're all gonna feel rejected, but I feel like don't set yourself up to, you know, it's like wanting to go to a party that you're not gonna have any fun at. Or wanting, to, you know, when someone rejects your friendship, and then you're like, I didn't wanna be this person's friend anyway. So think about protecting your work in a way of not putting it out there to be attacked, but really taking it to people who have similar interests or who can be moved, if they don't have similar interests, who can be moved by the craft and what you're saying. And after all of that, like what I recommend to my writing students is to go into the library or to go into Barnes & Noble and read all of the journals and find the one journal where you really feel you would fit in and send a letter to that editor. Because most of those editors know that we're not reading their journals and so they don't even go past the first page. But if you can send a letter to an editor that says, I know this, I know your journal, I know the people that you've published, I can really fit in there, you will get a response, and I, I, I'm sure that you will. And it's just really, you have to decide where you want your work to appear. Not because these journals get awards or they have MFA students publishing in them, but because someone is actually gonna pick it up and be moved by it. That, that's what you want, right? Yeah, that's what Yeah, well you all do it then. America's a dope fiend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just, uh, I guess, going off of one thing you said about like languages that we have, and I know, it was something I was thinking about recently, and like I totally agree with that. And I, I also feel that it's also important to have like, or for the world, I guess, to have you for a while is, I guess, the best way I can explain it. Like, which is something I think is easier in the woods maybe than in Brooklyn. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, like the times, the, like the silences in between, like rhythms and in between the songs, you can't put, like put time signatures to that. It's just yeah. like pure experience, pure sensation. And like, you know, the, the, like one word you can, you know, if you, if you just say, as like something I do, is just say one word to yourself, it becomes meaningless until you can't like attribute anything to it except for the sound, or if you're reading it, except mm -hmm. for like the way it looks or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just important to maybe, <coughs> excuse me, to not see the symbolism in things and just to like to intake the, the um, I don't know just the perception of it just yeah. the pure experience I guess I appreciate that sure. yeah that's how I'm feeling these days yeah that it all comes down to vibration uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah exactly yeah <laughs> you're the bomb thanks you too, you too yeah you're with life or against it <laughs> right. and you all liked his accent right <laughs> where are you from <laughs> I was like, yeah, because people like the, L.A., I'm, yeah. <laughs> and I see Dr. R.T. Young is up at the mic in Tacoma. Um, Tacoma has this great tradition. Hi, R.T. It's great to hi, see you. Hi, hi, 
Hi, Suhe. How are you? <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. Great to see you again. In Tacoma, our curriculum is based on four values. They are civility, inclusivity, hospitality, mm -hmm. and reciprocity. And so now we've come to the time when we reciprocate in some meager way for all that you have given to us today. And so this is what we call give back. And I think you've experienced it before. But as you know, the one thing we ask from you at this time is that you stop talking. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so we'll open here in Tacoma and then we'll go to Olympia, come back to Tacoma for a few give backs. So who wants to begin? Do you guys know what this is? It's amazing. Hi, I'm Frankie Ekan, a junior here on the Tacoma branch, and I would like to thank you for helping me today connect into some passions, uh, unknown passions, and connect with um, some creativity that I did not know, I was unaware that was inside of me. And due to your sharing today, I came up with my own first poetry at the age of 42 years old. So I would like to thank you and honor you for that. It goes like this. If I do not stand strong for my worth, then who? If I do not protect my integrity, then who? If I am not my own voice of truth, equality, and justice for all, then who? For I deserve to give back what has given, been given to me so freely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. 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 You, you want to? Uh, we're going to. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Tacoma. No, oh, okay. I, I can go. Okay, Dahlia, we'll go to Olympia, and then we'll go back to Tacoma. Okay, thanks. Yes. Hi, Zaheer. Um, my name is Dahlia, and um, your words were so powerful and touched my heart and touched so many places in me. And um, I saw you as you were walking in, and you touched my face and told me, what a, what a pretty face. And um, I looked at you and I saw my face reflected in yours. And it means so much to me to see uh, a powerful woman of color standing before us and speaking your words and having so much pride in who you come from and having immigrant parents and having a lot of experiences that I see reflected. And I don't see a lot of women like you standing up and being so powerful and it means so much it's so important and inspires me and i hope that you know um how how many ripples your words make um inside of all of us and across the world i feel like it changes our center of gravity it's so huge and i also feel like your rhythm and your your language um, made me feel brimming over with my own inspiration um, to speak and speak before people and and thank you um, and I, I just some little things that popped out I really loved you talking about going back to Palestine for three months and I just returned a few days ago from going back to the Philippines where my dad is from and I get it I get that experience of going back home even though it's a place you don't know and I just I feel like I love you so <laughs> thank you I reflect you for real thank you Dahlia thank you so much. Tacoma hi, hi. Um, my name is LaJohn and um, thank you thank you 
I am not one to stand boldly in front of a crowd. I am not one to say much of anything out loud. But you are so incredible. You gave me the courage to walk through my fear. So thank you. Thank you so very much for being here. Olympia. A captive thought, a captive dream holds us down and sets us free. The sky darkens, the rain pours, and barriers build like opaque doors. You break down those barriers, Suhair. I'm just amazed. I am amazed at your light and your vibration this community here and the community in Tacoma. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you guys ever had so much singing at any of these? <laughs> this is awesome. Next year we'll be tap dancing together. So here. So here. I'm right here. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Not allowed to talk. <laughs> Tacoma, Hi. welcome. Hi, I'm Meredith. And I just want to say that you, you blew my mind with your words. I feel really touched and moved. And sometimes life gets so busy and you forget to slow down and just really enjoy where you are. And you really did that for me today. I could slow down and just be here and listen to your words and feel them, and you brought tears to my eyes. So I just thank you for that. Hey, uh, my name's Kay. Um, I come to you from Detroit City in the 80s. Woo, D-Town. Oh, sorry. A, <laughs> in a city that was burning down and, and being destroyed on so many levels. Um, and my give back to you is those boots, baby. Whoa. I saw you step up on the stage and I thought, oh, where can I give me some of those? Maybe in red. <laughs> nice. So I'm going to pop out of that, that give back just for a minute because I've got some things on my mind. Um, I'm in a class called Colonialism to Decolonization. My focus here at Evergreen and why I came all the way out to these woods feeling foreign um, is to study political economy, to study how it is to get communities um, without borders together to create real change in this country because we need it and we need it now. Things that I'm thinking about that I'm kind of asking you to maybe like think about in a similar vein that I am and it's going to be kind of a mumble. Um, I'm thinking about power paradigms. I'm thinking about power shifts. I'm thinking about how to shift the power. I'm thinking about breaking down borders, breaking down borders between Palestinians, Jews, Israel, between the Latino community, between the black community, between the white community. I'm thinking about breaking down borders between queers, non-queers, people with trans, all different genders. I'm also, within that concept, thinking about what solidarity looks like. Not solidarity at that raised fist only, um, but what solidarity of the heart looks like and what that looks like in the breaking down the borders and how we can learn to trust each other. And I w wonder if I can just kind of hand that mask to you and see if you have anything that you can feed me with, which I know you do. Can't talk. Uh, I can talk, right? No. I can't talk now. <laughs> <laughs> can I tell you later? No. Our tea. See? RT, are we ready to hear from Peter? Yes, oh. yes we're right now, Suhair, I mean, uh, uh, Therese, we're ready to hear from Peter and then from Chico in Olympia. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Suhair. Hi. Um, on behalf of, of, of the faculty at Evergreen, uh, let me state, first of all, that it was a real honor to have you here. And um, during presentations, I always look at those in attendance, and I could tell automatically that uh, people were enthralled, they were excited, 
uh, they were educated, uh, and we thank you. We are honored by your presence uh, and our ability to hear you perform once again. Thank you very much. And Chico Herbison from the faculty at Evergreen. Hi, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm new to uh, Evergreen, new to the Pacific Northwest. Come from another country, it's called Kansas. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also new to this wonderful tradition of give back, and, and I hope that I can adequately uh, express our gratitude. But I just wanted to thank you for a few reminders that you've given us. Uh, first, to never, ever look away and to not allow each other to look away. Secondly, uh, this comes from a poem that changed your life, uh, Moving Towards Home, the reminder that uh, it is time to make our way home. Um, and from an interview that you uh, gave two years ago, we're all creative beings and we live in a time of destruction. We should always find time to dance and sing and write poetry and celebrate. And then uh, finally, quite selfishly, if I can make a personal connection here, I too wanted to thank you for, for Daddy's song because um, uh, it's been two years since I lost my father and it's been a hard time. It's been very difficult for me to hear his voice, but uh, I read that poem and uh, your voice gave way to Sam Cooke's voice and, and that gave way to my father's voice. I hear him again. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks um, again to Suhair. I think everybody in the Give Back, thanks to Tacoma for your tradition of Give Back, which we have learned so much from you. And another round for Suhair. I have a couple. A quick announcement, you won't want to miss seeing Suhair again November 4th. She is the Sunday, November 4th, 5 p.m. at Capitol Theater. She is the kickoff event for the Advocating Activism series of the Olympia Film Festival. She will be performing with Dar Jamal, unembedded journalist who is reporting from Iraq on Beyond Occupation. So be there, Capitol Theater. Maybe not the same boots, she said. Oh, she will. You could see her boots. Also, in connection to some of Suhair's poetry, in our library through November 10th, Sesame is hosting a presentation of Israeli and Palestinian photographers and activists called Jerusalem Dispossessed. Um, stop by the library and check it out. And Paul has some announcements. Yeah, as a follow-up follow to Suhair's presentation today, Therese, Maritza Sanchez, McElmore, and Maria Alacon will uh, lead a workshop on poetry and spoken word Wednesday, November 7th from noon to 2. And if you want to register for that, contact the Women of Color Coalition. Also, Mecha will host the Dia de los Muertos altar building and potluck tomorrow in the Long House at 6 p.m. You're encouraged to bring photos of your loved ones who have passed on, flowers, candles, sugar skulls, and other uh, ornaments for the community altar. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for coming. R.T., did you have something to say? Oh, yes. Our, yes. Our Dr. Young? Uh, yes, on behalf of the Tacoma students, staff, and faculty, we are inviting all of our colleagues and peers and students in Olympia to a live performance of the New Orleans uh, monologues on January 22nd at 11 in the morning and 6 in the evening. Y'all come. <laughs> All right, we'll be Very there. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to all the tech support for this, to make this possible.